and welcome to another exciting episode of Adventuring Academy, Dimension 20's vodcast, where we talk about all things related to tabletop and gaming, how to run the game, how to play the game, and everything like that. Today, we have such a wonderful guest. I'm so excited to share them with all of you. Uh, you know him uh, uh, as a singer, vocalist, gamer, and streamer, and TRPG player online. Uh, he's created music for Critical Role, notably the theme for Critter Hug, uh, which is a CR show about positivity and creativity in the TRPG space. Uh, he will also be moderating a panel during the upcoming D&D celebration on what it means to be a bard. I'm slowly giving you clues as to who our guest is going to be. Uh, creator and host of the Black AF Roundtable series, uh, where he led discussions with other Black creators and artists in the TRPG space about race, racism, and being Black in the tabletop community. Uh, that awesome roundtable had a bunch of other uh, members of the Dimension 20 family that you should go and absolutely check out. Uh, he regularly stream, streams on Twitch.tv, uh, where you can see his show In Unison, where he duets with someone else and discusses various topics with them. Uh, he will also be appearing as a PC on a new stream slash campaign uh, called Creature Collectors, DM'd by Lilith Sparks, and also featuring a member of Pirates of Leviathan, Abria Iyengar. You know him. You love him. He needs no introduction, but we gave him one anyway. Please welcome the critical bard, Omega Jones! Yeah, yeah, queen. You gotta get the one in the back. The one that's in the back is like, yes, queen, we live for you. No. <laughs> know that that is absolutely happening in digital space. We just don't have the, the ability to port that in in our audio. Uh, Omega, <laughs> thanks so much for being with us today. How are you doing? I am doing. That is the best I can do uh, as we live in Corona country right now. Um, so, no, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I am uh, surviving, uh, living, uh, staying hydrated because that's important. Uh, yeah, I'm doing good. I cannot. Well, I mean, I can't complain, but I'm not going to complain. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to make you spit out your water. I already know it's going to happen. <laughs> Oh no, a terrifying forecast for the episode with all this electronic stuff around me. Um, uh, Omega, it's so awesome to have you. I'm such a huge fan of your work. Um, you are an incredible uh, vocalist and artist and someone who has brought a tremendous amount of talent to the tabletop role-playing space. Um, Talk to me a little bit about like your history, both as like what got you into singing and performance in the first place, and then what got you into tabletop, and then like when was the moment that you realized like, hey, this the these two vectors are going to come in together and create something really meaningful. What's sort of your story with those different passions? So I mean, like just being real, like most black people, they grew up in church. Um, mostly because their mother and or their grandmother forced them to go, which is fine, that's valid. Uh, but no, I grew up in church. Uh, I grew up with a loving family uh, and I was put into choir because most of the female folk on my uh, uh, family uh, all sang. My sister, my mom, my aunt, my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother actually ran one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, choirs at my church and all these things. So I was like quickly uh, like, uh, put into the, the church choir as a little boy soprano up there. Uh, and it was great. And, and I loved it. And that sparked my love for music. Uh, I've been singing literally again since I was a kid. Um, Scrooting in the stratosphere like Mariah Carey. Uh, and uh, with that, I learned about theater. Um, my aunt also did some performance in theater, specifically like The Wiz, one of my favorite movies and musicals. Um, and then my high school ended up doing West Side Story, and West Side Story was, was one of my favorite uh, musicals, like, ever. I love the movie. Um, now that I look back at, at it, I'm like, ooh, that's racist. However, <laughs> I did love that movie when I first saw it. Uh, and it, I auditioned, I got into the show, and then from there, I became stuck in this artistic realm of theater and music and dance and all that stuff. And that's been my life since then. Um, Skipping a couple of years later, I met a director, um, it was about four four years ago, met a director um, when I was doing a 24-hour play festival, which is stressful, let me tell you that right now. Uh, and he was like, Omega, you want to play some Dungeons and Dragons? And I'm like, uh -huh, no. Uh, <laughs> but for some reason, I said, yeah. And I, we played, and I played my Tempest Cleric, and like, there was something about that game 
that I just loved because I got to be myself as an actor, but with dice added, you know? I got to go in there and perform and have these moments. No, it wasn't about me. It was still something nice and familiar about taking on these roles and these characters and going through this journey and doing all these things. Yeah, adding a fireball every now and then. But, like, there was something so just me about it that it stuck. And now I've been stuck ever since. That was about, again, four years ago. And now I'm here, this this vocalist D&D guy who is a hot mess and eats honey buns. That's me. <laughs> I mean, perfect. Uh, uh, truly perfect. Um, that's so wonderful to hear. I love the idea. What drew you to uh, a Tempest cleric as your first character? Because, first of all, I love Tempest clerics. They're mm-hmm. great, great class and subclass. Um, but it's so funny to, to, was there any part of you when you were first picking that that like drew you to that specifically? So, yes and no. Uh, I knew I wanted to play a cleric. There was something about the cleric that I liked. I didn't know what that was, but I was like, this seems like it'd be me. You kind of support people from the back and doing all these things. But I also, when I was like doing a lot of studying and looking into it, because that's what I, I, just like any role I take on, I'm going to do the research and understand what this thing is. So I was like looking into clerics and all this stuff, and I was like, but I don't want to always be the healer. That's pfft, that's whatever. Uh, and then I saw Tempest, and I was like, oh, you can heal and do damage. Okay. <laughs> um, like if anybody likes Overwatch, like Tempest clerics are like the Moira of the situation. You can heal or do a lot of damage. So I was like, okay, I like them. So I picked that, and there was something about it. I just love my cleric. My cleric was a uh, uh, a uh, cleric of Talos, uh, of cool. storms and destruction, and he actually made it a point to be like, uh, "You need to pull your weight in this party, or you will not get healed." Uh, <laughs> I will, I will never forget, I we got to this gauntlet type of place where we're fighting a lot of different, um, like, reoccurring enemies who just kept coming and coming. And one of them was a frost giant, and frost giants are not easy. And they knocked out one of our, uh, Claire, one of our characters. It was the uh, swashbuckler. And that swashbuckler all day had just been heckling my character, just doing these small little snippy comments. And they got knocked out, and then my turn came around, and DM was like, hey... So uh, you have the uh, Frost Giant. One of your party members are down. You can go heal them if you want or do what you want. And I looked at them and I looked at the Frost Giant and I looked back at them and I was like, you can suffer for one more round. And I got started. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, you're going to learn today. Don't don't piss off your cleric. <laughs> they have diamonds. You don't. Uh, but no, yeah, I, I, I loved that. Uh, I love that class. I actually haven't played a Tempest cleric since I played that character. It's weird. Uh, but, I, mm-hmm. No, but I love that. Again, that, that vibe is so fun. And when you tap into that character in that way, um, obviously one a character class we need to talk about other than Cleric is the Bard class. Now there's obvious, there's some obvious carryover as to why someone uh, with your singing talent would be drawn to uh, the, the game's magical musicians and singers. Um, and you're running a panel for D and D celebration coming up on September, uh, coming up this later this September. Um, talk to me a little bit about like the Bard class and what that means to you in the context of D and D, and like what draws you to that class. So, I mean, elephant in the room. I am a real life Bard, uh, but no, I there was something about them. Well, firstly, you know, they are about support and uplifting and inspiring. The group around them. I mean, bardic inspiration is literally embedded into into their class features. So they are there to inspire and 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 lift up. However, something about bards and something I take into account when I'm like performing as well. Um, the point of a bard, to me, I am not perfect, and I'm not the end all be all. Um, the point of a bard to me is to tell the story. It is about continuing that that history in such a way that you never forget. I I use this example today. You probably remember one of the first concerts you went to. You probably don't remember the words, probably don't remember everything, but you probably remember the feeling you got. You remember what happened. You remember everything. Do you remember the first math question you answered in first grade? (laughs) You don't. (laughs) But I mean, I mean, there's something about music and performance that allows history to never die um and there and i'm a big mythology nerd i have always been a mythology nerd and two gods that i legit want to get tattoos of or at least combine them in some way shape or form 
um, is Apollo, the god of music and poetry and all those things, and Anansi the spider from West African Mythos. Um, he is the god of stories. And there's something so powerful about both of them. And what they mean to me is simply remembering that no matter the situation, there's always a story that surrounds it. And that story is going to go through generations and generations. It's why we know about the fall of Troy or like slavery or all these other things, all these things that have died out, but we know them because the story is continuing to be told. And that's what a bard does. A bard is there not just to support the party and inspire them in that moment, but inspire them until their last breath. That's why I like it. That's really beautiful. And they it's something very fun anytime you have a bard in a party or in fact have a friend who's sort of a bard in real life they are that perfect thing uh i feel like one of the best pieces of advice i got was sort of like every party like you will never be in a situation where the bard isn't able to do something useful because that's the whole definition of that character is that thing of like passing on inspiration, uh, having these like, a whole host of skills that they can use and call to their attention. And there's something very beautiful too about having a character archetype that honors storytelling and performance mm -hmm. while you are in a game that is fundamentally about the power of storytelling and performance, mm -hmm. right? It sort of has that fractal, it's like echoes of what we're experiencing together at the table are here yeah. in this character in the game with us. Exactly. Um, uh, that's so beautiful. Um, uh, I love that. And yeah, uh, and I and I, I'm just excited to. I mean, with with the, the panelists I have, first and foremost, they're just amazing because they're all bards in their own right in the world. But I think we're all going to bring something beautiful to that panel because we all have experienced storytelling and performing or whatever your bardic style is, and we again, aren't the, the, the end-all, be-all what it means to be a bard, but we have experienced it so in-depth, it's like ingrained in our spirits, that I think that we're going to be able to answer some questions and hopefully inspire, <laughs> inspire some future players who want to also play bards. Uh, and we're going to also um, uh, answer the internal question, why do bards always have to seduce a dragon? <laughs> I'm over it. <laughs> I'm completely over it. <laughs> I I have a character in my back pocket that I, I I almost, as I say, I feel like in every episode of Adventuring Academy, I very rarely get to play. I'm sort of a perma DM, but um, I have a, that, that stereotype of like the hot bard, because there's something like all of your six ability scores can be interpreted in all these different ways. Um, and as someone who uh, uh, does not have the gift of a beautiful <laughs> singing voice, um, I definitely, I was like, oh, I love the bard class. Um, and was thinking about like, what are other ways to like play that archetype and made this character who is sort of like the old, like Irish fairy tale, like peddler, traveler, mm. storyteller character, that sort of mm -hmm. like trickster storyteller. And with the idea of a character who's probably like, scruffy and busted and older and not necessarily this like hot seductive uh, character, but has that other type of charisma where it's like you hang on their every word yeah. and all those different definitions of charisma that come off of that word, because it is um, such an, it's, being the set skill, the set attribute of a bard is their charisma. It is so funny to think like, yeah, this means more than just necessarily your seductive appeal. Otherwise, some really goofy things become true about the world where you're like, sorcerers get their magic from yep. hotness. Yeah. <laughs> yep. No, no, I, that, that's my thing. I'm like, so if it's based in the charisma that you think bards need to seduce dragons, why don't paladins seduce dragons? Why don't Orochs <laughs> seduce dragons? Why don't sorcerers seduce dragons? All these other things that are charisma based, they're not doing anything. So what is it about you, Barty? Like, <laughs> I will yeah. say a story about a paladin seduce, of someone being like, <laughs> Like, my king has ordered me. I must seduce this dragon. Like, that could be their oath. The oath of the ancients, maybe. <laughs> like, I'm here for that. I would I mean, be very here for that. Exactly. That sounds well, like a great story. It's funny you mentioned it because, like, um, I get into, it's not even an argument, but people um, think that to play a bard, you have to sing or dance. Not true. At all. Again, it's about telling the story. Like two blards up blards, two bards I play. Um, one is actually my main character because the Tempest cleric got killed. Rip. 
Um, but uh, I'm playing, uh, I'm using Matt Mercer's College of the Maestro Bard. He doesn't necessarily play music. He orchestrates the music. He is the one in the background just like, uh-uh, no. <laughs> Fix that chord real quick. He's not really the most musical, but he can just influence the, the, the way music flows around. And music isn't just like literally singing. It's just like that primordial power that can just inspire and boost. So like, he's been a lot of fun to play. And I also have a, oh Lord. I, oh Lord. His name is Sigma. He is a Warforged bard. And basically his story is that he was traveling with his drow bard who got killed. But he is like the drow's accompaniment. He's just 808. He's literally a beatboxing bard. <laughs> It that sounds like so GLaDOS. Cool. She's like, hello, I am Sigma. <laughs> oh, well, drop the bass. Shatter. Like, that's him. <laughs> oh, God. The idea, the idea of an 808 bard is so good. Just like, I just, all, from that one character, all I want to do is make like a bright neon, like 1980s <laughs> fantasy. Just like... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because he has one of the instruments of the bard, but we flavored it to be a subwoofer that's in his stomach. So oh. literally, he, he just like he just he just constantly gets always going. He's so much fun, but he's really not about music. He is music, so he can do it, but he's not like a singer. He's just there. And it's like, hello. <laughs> God, just the flavors of any spell that Bard would cast of just be levitate is just like the subwoofer orients down and it's mm -hmm. woof, 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 just moving up. That's well, like I said, like one of my favorite, I, mean, I, I guess I just said it, but I'll say it again. One of my favorite things I ever did with him was we were in a, we were in a battle and like I said, I beatbox with him. I'm not the best beatboxer, but I beatbox with him. And literally, he just like started breaking it down. But he was like, drop the bass. And as the bass dropped, a big shatter happened. <laughs> so <laughs> the shatter is literally so the bass funny. dropping. It's just like, yes. And like, I killed a lot of people with that. But like, he was, oh, he's just so much fun. I love this character. He oh. has like an intelligence of seven, but I love him. <laughs> That's so perfect. Oh, I love that so much. Um, and I think you know what's funny is so so we I don't know what order these adventuring academies come out, but we happened to record a couple days ago an adventuring academy with your uh, co PC uh, on your new stream coming out that's DM by Lilith Sparks, uh, uh, which is uh, Creature Collectors. Which I think well that that'll be on Twitch or where is that going to be living? That's going to be on my channel. We actually uh, we are going to be. Um... Wow, blanking. Sundays. Sundays at 3 Pacific, 2 Pacific, one of those Pacifics. Um, but yeah, we're on my channel. Uh, and yeah, Lily Sparks is a DM. Abria uh, is amazing. And oh, I don't know who her character is. I just know that she is a, a, a gorgeous woman with bright white hair. And I am so ready. Uh, oh. It's going to be a good, it's going to be a good campaign, especially because in our DM's own words, it is inspired by Pokemon, Digimon, Cardcaptor, Sakura, Ghostbusters. I love <laughs> this so much. But So both talking about your character Sigma and talking about this upcoming creature collector, which is inspired by these elements of pop culture and storytelling that I feel like everyone growing up around me was like obsessed with Digimon and Pokemon mm -hmm. and still is. Uh, uh, but the that idea of using these pop culture artifacts that we know and love so much mm -hmm. and applying them to this game that in its written materials doesn't reference those pop culture things. Abria was talking about this herself of being like, um, there's nothing as fun as bringing your own references, your own culture, your own stories, your own archetypes mm -hmm. and tropes and things like that into the game with you. And you talking about Sigma and then launching this thing, the, this new stream that will be Pokemon and Digimon inspired. Um, I just love, that's my favorite element of the game is putting those twists on the source material to be mm -hmm. like, we're going to tell this new genre with that. Mm -hmm. What was, when did you first, because I feel like a lot of people when they start, because we have a lot of people watch this show that maybe haven't played their first game yet. They're gearing up the courage or they're getting the people together to run their first game. How long did it take you before you were like, actually, I'm going to put a twist on this to bring this new genre into it? <laughs> So it actually happened pretty quickly. So that's where my mind goes. So backstory, but not really backstory. I was a, I was trash, first of all. Uh, but 
I I used to love to role play on Tumblr. I had so many accounts. I had so many accounts. And it was just so much fun to take these characters that we knew, like Agent J from Men in Black or Sam Witwicky from Star some from Transformers. Like all these random characters and just like bring new life to them. So like I started applying that to D D because like I really did back then. I would wake up and do whatever and be like, I'm gonna make this character today. And I did. And that's kind of started what happened. That started happening with D&D where I just get inspired by these random moments. And what happened really quickly after I had this Tempest Cleric and some other stuff and one of those uh, players in that 25 person campaign. Uh, <laughs> we don't all play at once, but during our finale days we do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one of them is like, I wanna DM something. If you all wanna join, make a character. For some reason, the first thing that came to mind was, I'm going to play Waldo. Like, where's Waldo? And and D&D. And I named him Wadlow. And he was an arcane trickster. And he always had to steal things to make him invisible. And his girlfriend was Carmen Sendigo. And all these things, like, yeah. Yeah, I went full in. But, like, I was like, I, I like taking pop culture and all these things. And it's showing that this game isn't just about, like, Faerun or the Forgotten Realms or all these things that's there. You can take that and flavor it and make it what you want it to be. Because at the end of the day, as we've already said, as I flip it and reverse it, this game is about telling a story. It's not telling their story. It's telling your story. Oh. So make the story whatever you want it to be. The best oh. possible advice you could walk away from this with. I have to. I want to dive more into that topic because I think that's such important, so important for people that want to play this game to hear that. But mm -hmm. I need to digress and say, there is such a bizarre echo, bizarre in terms of how synchronous it is. I used to freeform text-based role play on AOL Instant Messenger. Yes. yes! <laughs> like every day. You know your boy was on AIM every day. Do it. I had a character in this setting run by uh, some good friends of mine um, that was called Zane Academy, and it was the whole thing was it was it was like a Hogwarts for Zane, which was a type of magic based in like cartoonish, absurdist, mm. uh, surreality. So my I, one of my students that was going there was named Elroy San Diego. He was the child of Carmen San Diego and Waldo. And he was so good at hiding that it was like a mutant sort of X-Men power he couldn't turn off. Oh. People had a hard time remembering him because their <laughs> neurons couldn't find the memories of him. That they oh, that makes me so happy. It's, he was like a very sad, shy little boy who was just like, like constantly trying to be like, yeah, teachers would be like, you've been absent. Like, we have to fail you. And he's like, no, I promise. I've been in every single class. So it was very like, he was so good at hiding that his life was quite sad, but it was a, uh, um, so it was a very fun, uh, but I, so first of all, weirdly synchronous that we both have, have in <laughs> X-Space role-playing had these characters, Wadlow and then Elroy San Diego. Um, uh, but I think that that is something that's really important too. And I, and I want to tie this back into other uh, work that you've been doing in the TRPG space. Um, because I picked up these books a long time ago. I was like 10 years old when I picked up these books. And similarly, it wasn't that long before I got the itch to go like, I want to tell other kinds of stories in this space. Mm -hmm. Because I think that that is the, the secret gift of any tabletop game, be it, be it Dungeons and Dragons, be it, you know, any the vast amount of indie games that are out there is always no, there's not gonna be a ref from the game company at your table. The mm -hmm. only people you're really beholden to are you and your friends. And the golden rule is gonna be, are we all having a good time? Are we all communicating? Are we all respecting each other? Are we building a story that's getting us all equally hype and excited, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit too about some of the other work that you've been doing in the TRPG space, specifically to make it a more 
welcoming and inclusive space to people that the game has not always been as welcoming and inclusive to as it should be. Um, uh, for anyone that has not watched the Black AF Roundtable, please do yourself a favor and go check it out. It is an incredible resource for anybody that is interested in making their table more inclusive and welcoming. Um, how did that project get started? And what were like your first steps that sort of inspired you to start that and to bring those people together? So to be very blunt, someone got killed. Um, someone got killed yet again. Uh, I want to also start this years back, 2014 back. I lived in Ferguson. Wow. I was there when he got killed. I was not in the streets, but I was there in my hometown when he got killed. It actually is really sad because I was coming home from rehearsal that day. And as I was coming home, my friends was like, we're going to take you to our house. And I was like, why? And it was like, you know why? Just no. So I went to their house instead in, in like, uh, like a, a town over. Um, and I knew everything that happened and everything was going down. And then the indictment trial happened of the officer. And I was in my house in Ferguson, literally up the street to the left is the police station. Uh, and I remember all my friends are like, it's tense and it's, you know, gets super immense feelings. And I had went out as well with my brothers, just looking around, seeing how the, um, how the energy was. And I was getting all these texts and all these things. People were like, is there going to be a riot? Is this going to happen? Are people going to be mad? And I'm like, yep. Uh, because we all knew what was going to happen. And he didn't get indicted. And literally, it was like a bomb went off. We just saw the chaos ensue because we were so angry. So I've, I've lived personally through it. Thank God I am not a statistic. I haven't been one of those people. Hopefully, I never I never am. But know that I, I, I witnessed it enough and I lived it myself. Then we come to now with George Floyd. And, I've, and you know, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and all these other people who are just it's so many names, you can't even count them anymore. George Floyd, specifically his death, is what triggered or, or, or was a catalyst for a lot of the outrage and riots and protesting and everything and happening. And I was sitting here like, what can I do? Because I'm tired. <laughs> I am a Black man in this world who is tired of living in a world that doesn't want me to exist. How do I even process? How do I go on? Um, and I had this thought, and I posted on Twitter, and I was like, who wants to chat? Because I know a lot of people feel like talking. Who wants to chat? And I got some some feedback and some thoughts and people was like, I'm in and all these things. And I reached out to Tanya the Past, aka Cypher of Tear. Uh, and I was like, hey, do you want to be a part of this thing? She was the first person I asked. And she was like, yeah. Um, and then I also reached out to Christina Ariel, Gabe Hicks, Honey and Dice, Michael Sinclair II, and Brandon Dixon. Uh, I feel like I'm missing somebody. Nope, that's everybody, plus Tiny and me. Um, and I reached out to them, and we were like, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. This is the Black AF roundtable, because one, we're Black AF, and two, people need to understand our feelings. And in the same vein, in that same parallel universe, we were dealing with a lot of the orc discourse that was happening within Dungeons and Dragons. Orc and Drow and all these things. Also the Vistani and, and Curse of Strahd and all these things. And we were like, so much is happening. We're tired, blah, blah, blah. Let's get it all out. So with that and the deaths, we said, let's make this round table. So I made this round table. I hosted it on my channel. I was like, we're going to do this. I'm not the best at doing this, but let's do it. And it was something that I didn't know that everyone would need. I did not expect it to go as far as it did. I'll never forget looking at my Facebook, maybe like an hour or two after it was done, realizing that Will Whedon had posted about it. And I was like, what? Uh, but like, that's how, that's how much people didn't realize they needed something like this because it wasn't being talked about. And I wanted to specifically make sure it was, while we are Black and living in this space, we're going to always talk about it as a whole. I wanted to make sure it was centered in on being Black in the tabletop community because there's a lot of overt racism that we know of, but there's a lot of covert racism that has, happens as well, and we needed to talk about both. Uh, we need to talk about why people needed to understand that orcs and drow as inherently evil, especially being the monstrous or the dark version, is bad. That's not okay. We needed to talk about all these things, and it was nice to do so. And then once that one happened and we saw how many people liked it, we were like, let's do another one. And we did another one uh, a week after. And then we just did one last week. That was the third 
third point five rendition. And I say point five because I was not expecting D and D to reach out and be like, "Hey, for D and D Live, do you want to do a version of the roundtable?" Sure. So we did it for D and D Live as well. So it's like it's been a conversation and something that's been a big part of my life that I didn't know I needed, and I'm glad it happened, and I'm glad people are getting the free education that we are giving people. <laughs> Uh, truly from the bottom of my heart, thank you for doing that. And to the, your fellow members of the round table as well. It is something that is needed. It is dramatically needed, um, uh, both for, I think for every single person in the hobby, because, you know, it's, there, there's a conversation I had recently with someone that was talking about, like, you look at the inspiration, as you've said, for that first thing, which was, again, a horrifying murder by the police, the, the murder of George Floyd. And that, like, prompting, hopefully, every single sphere, hobby, at no corner of the earth should not take that, and in fact, all of these horrific deaths, as part of us reckoning with what we have control over. And I think that's something that maybe people that are watching this show right now can hear for themselves, is that there is something to do within your hobby. There is some part of the little corner of the earth that you occupy that requires this care and attention as well. Um, and, it, you know, like that uh, discourse around orcs and drought, it does have an impact and it does matter. And it's so encouraging to see the power of that round table from my perspective, really be an inflection point where the conversation around that changed and like the, the a critical mass of people now get why that is not only, not only matters, but is true. The, the viewpoint shared by you is obviously something that cannot stand and has to change. Um, so thank you very much for creating. Again, it's like you're talking free education. It's an incredible generosity. Anytime people like do the hard work of putting something like that together and producing something that is this living resource on the internet for people to educate themselves, it is an act of generosity that anyone now can go and educate themselves using that. So thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, it's one of those where I was like, Obviously, it's not about the money, I, but also pay me. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, period. Uh, because guess what? Google is your friend. And if it's not, <laughs> beat him. Hello, I'm introducing you today. Um, but it wasn't just about that. It's just the fact that someone needed to do it. It's not one of those, if no one's going to do it, I'm going to do it. But it's just like, I have the platform now, thankfully. I have the platform, and I have the masses who are willing to listen. So why not do something with it? And at that time, I was like, that's, that's what happened. It felt like that was the right thing to do. So I'm glad. I'm glad that people listened. And I'm glad. And I hope, and I say that cautiously, I hope that people heed what we said and listen and don't listen to throw it away. Don't listen to just bleh once it's all done. Because unfortunately, we talked about that at our last roundtable. We yeah. watched two months of the best performance of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Because okay, I tell people, I am an equity actor. I perform professionally. And there are better performers than me on Twitter and life. I talk about, I we found this graph, and I forgot what it, I forgot what the site was. But you literally can see, I'm sorry over here, you literally can see like May, June, July. Instantly. And it's like, wow. But it's like one of those, while there's a lot of negativity and while I know that people didn't really want to care, they did it because it was a fad and it was a trend to do, there are some who are putting in the work and are continuing and listening and, and taking that in and trying to better the spaces around them, whether that's in, within tabletop or their families and all that stuff. And while I'm not going to give you a chocolate chip cookie for your effort, I do see it and I thank it. I thank you for it. Like, that's um. It. Yeah, the um, I think that's all completely right on. And the uh, you know I, I it's it's one of those things where like I I am very glad for exactly what you've said. It makes me very glad that these are continuing. That you guys are doing more of them uh, because I think that it is like it is a call to arms that uh, should never stop being called. And so that I like. Deeply, deeply grateful and glad that uh, these like roundtables 
continue because I think that you're exactly right. Um, looking at the, uh, the, the things we've covered that we can see you on, we can consume uh, uh, your talent, your content, your thoughts, your wisdom, your experience. Um, Looking at, uh, I want to talk quickly as well about In Unison. Um, mm -hmm. This is a show where you invite people on to duet with them. Um, talk to me a little bit about uh, In Unison, how that project started, uh, uh, and also where people can check that out. I assume they can check it out at your Twitch. Mm -hmm. So In Unison, I mean, it, everything happens for a reason. There are two things I believe in, and that's time and that's fate. One, things happen when they're supposed to happen, and two, they're going to happen whether you want them to happen or not. Uh, so I, after the roundtables, I was chatting with my friends and I was like, you know, I really like hosting. I really like moderating. I do it very well. And especially living in the plane of pandemics in COVID city where we can't perform or do anything like that. I'm like, this is has this has been a good like outlet for me creatively and just being able to be on in all those things. And while it's not about me, it did, I tell them, like, it did feel good to actually host and moderate. So I was like, I'm going to do something else. And I didn't know what that was. And then I was just looking around and seeing the fatigue and seeing how much people were working and it feels like nothing's really happening. And I wanted to do something where I spoke to some more visible people in the community, not to, like, target anyone, but, like, I wanted to focus on some more visible people in the community who put in the work, whatever that work is. And I wanted to have a show where they can just relax and be people, not their product, just be the person that they are. So that's where In Unison came from. In Unison, yeah, we do wet, AKA just me and another person. We do wet about life, liberty, and the pursuit of being a hot mess. That's one of my taglines. <laughs> like, it's just, we we sit down for two hours, we take a break in the middle. I say, if you wanna, I don't know how much I can say, if you wanna have a drink, have a drink. If you wanna eat, eat, do whatever you want. But it's just us talking, yes, I have topics, but, it's us just vibing, feeling each other's energy, and just enjoying a couple of hours, not worrying about work, not worrying about stress, not worrying about life. Just you come in and muse, do whatever you want. And it's been very cathartic. Um, I've had a good chunk of guests on there now, and I'm, I'm always asking for more. If, if you want to be on, let me know. Um, but yeah, it, it's been nice. Like I started with Brian Foster from Critical Role, and that was a a, a bad choice because he's a mess. I love him. He's a mess. I can say that. He's one of my closest friends. He's a mess. Um, <laughs> but like Brian Foster and like I just had Todd Kennerick from DD Beyond and Abria actually is a player next week. Um uh so just like it's 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 been so good. Not just for me. I am benefiting from it just from being able to chat with people, but it's been nice seeing these folk who I know are just stressed and just tired. Just come on and be like, oh, thank you. What's up? Like, that's been nice. So that's what that show is. The show is just about chill vibes and good times. That sounds completely lovely. <laughs> <laughs> chill vibes and good times. Um, that's, well, that's excellent. So this is uh, uh, a, there's so much uh, incredible Omega Jones content out there on the internet. If you're watching this, you should absolutely go check it out. I think it is high time for us to jump into some of these uh, uh, user submitted questions from our Dropout Discord server. Thank you everyone for dropping these questions to us. Um, whoop, whoop. Woo, we're gonna talk about some, some questions people have for, hey, how, how I do this tabletop role playing thing uh, and uh, our first question comes to us um, from Emma. Thank you, Emma. Um, Emma. What advice would you have for someone who is playing in a group that the group is not that big into RP, but they themselves love RP? If I do the voice that I know is right for the character I'm playing, I know that I'll be the only one doing a parentheses bad voice. Uh, how do you balance different play styles between a group of friends so that everyone is enjoying playing? Thanks for the question, Emma. Honestly, so it's two parts to that. Two, and this is going to sound mean and weird, but no one else matters. What I mean by that is, if you're enjoying the role that you're playing, if you're enjoying the character that you want to play, just because someone else in your group isn't doing that voice doesn't mean you have to stop. 
it's something that brings you joy. It's not like you're using it to like upstage people and have the spotlight on you. It's just you playing a character. I naturally have voices when I play too because it's just, it feels right and it feels like what I want to do. I also play with a lot of engineers who don't really care about the uh, role play. They care about the numbers of the mm -hmm. game. And that's valid too. You're going to find that not every table is super unanimous in how they play. Um, obviously, you can talk. I mean... Session zero, so if you don't know what a session zero is, a session zero is the session zero before one. You, It's a pregame. It's to talk about what you want out of a game, what you expect out of a game. Nowadays, we talk about using safety tools, which is our ways to make sure your game is safe and happy and, and good for everyone playing. You lay out what the type of character you might end up playing. You don't have to tell secrets or anything like that. But you, you you let them know, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I want to do, and all these things. And you all talk about what expectations are from each player. And then once you set that, going forward, it's a breeze. Uh, again, if they don't role play or act like you do, one, you're not doing anything bad. Take those parentheses away and throw them to the moon. They don't matter. Um, you're not bad. Um, you're just having fun, and it's okay to have fun. So yeah, I mean, talk talk with your party, talk with your fellow players, talk with the DM. If you're the DM, you definitely can talk with the parties and just be like, hey, I see folks are more interested in combat. And then I see you're more interested in social or exploration. Talk about those things. You can come together to make a beautiful game. Beautiful. I love that. I think that that's, that's right on the money. And again, uh, one of the things about D&D &D is that you are going to have in any given party a degree of everyone bringing their own unique flavor to the game, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be happening no matter what. I think that um, if you have insecurity or nerves around being the person at the table doing the voice, I would just say that that I have been a part of games and also seen games. I used to be a camp counselor and people would be playing games in the corner. You could be the one person doing a voice and have that be a joy at the table. Like mm -hmm. there is nothing to indicate that just uh, um, in the same way that like, I think the best thing is to appreciate what everyone is bringing to mm -hmm. the metaphorical potluck, right? Yeah. Let's say you, Let's say you have that number crunchy person at your table who's super into the numbers. That can be a wonderful person to have at the table when they like, you know, remind of when they pull a like rules lawyer for justice move that gets you all out of a bad like mechanical situation that you're uh -huh. in. Or they remind you like, hey, you actually have advantage on this role. And you're like, oh, and yep. then you hit and then uh -huh. you, exactly you hit the nat 20 you have the every... one that like you know you forgot this certain part of history but they're like actually i wrote it in my notes because you won't <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> nothing wrong, nothing with, wrong that. with that so, as yeah. long as it's, as long as everyone's vibing and everyone's communicating it's all good and so being that one person with the character voice at the table can be a source of joy i remember being really young and playing a game for the first time where i was one of the few people at the table who was really comfortable like emoting and I was playing this character that was a guardian angel, but that had been sworn to the service of what ended up being a really bad person. So it was like a kind of like that period of like Aladdin where the genie is serving Jafar and he's super. And so everything my character did, I was like, please forgive me. I, I have to do this, but I really would rather not. <laughs> and uh, so it was like, oh, and it, it um, I think that in an ideal circumstance, you will find that if you're doing something that brings you joy, if you're playing with other people who genuinely want everyone to be having a good time, even if they're not following suit, it can still bring joy to the whole table for you Agreed. to engage in that. Agreed, 100%. Um, hell yeah, thanks for the question, Emma. Um, this next one comes to us from Piper F. Thanks, Piper. Uh, Piper. Yeah, I know music can make the setting and tone clear, but where do you believe the best D&D &D music comes from? I would love to incorporate it into my campaigns, but I feel like I can't find the right music. Um, this is a great question. Um, uh, there are obviously a lot of services that provide this that are like specifically, like you can find like DMDJ or Sirenscape or stuff like that. Yeah. Honestly, I'll throw it out. I do a lot of my like DM DJ just on YouTube. There's tons of free, like whether you're looking for like ambient stuff mm -hmm. or like a or a specific track. 
I remember there was uh, uh, there was one specific scene in uh, my long running home game where we like literally I had a like cut scene and narrated to the Nicholas Brothers tap routine uh, with Cab Calloway singing. Yes. <laughs> You just it, became my best friend. Sorry oh about my it. God. Period. That's it's what life is now. <laughs> uh, for those that haven't checked that out on YouTube, it's up on YouTube. It is the best filmed dance. I, I think it's not. I I will go to bat and say it's the best filmed dance routine in film history. Go watch it. Um, it it's iconic. Iconic is the exact word. It is unbelievable. Um, and we had this. Um, uh, uh, there was this thing we were narrating where I was like, oh, our sorcerer from this, this is a world where, sor because this is like an old, old campaign, it's where sorcerers work a lot more like war warlocks, where they get their powers from other beings. And there was this moment where um, this this sorcerer luck child kid had been wheeling and dealing between um, the personified sort of arcana of destiny and the personified arcana of luck who were in competition mm. for like years and years and years. And at the very end, the the kid managed to get double get out of the contract where he sold his soul to these two. And it ended up in this whole like dance routine song and number where luck and destiny were like doing the moves of the Nicholas brothers from Storm. It was very like, uh, uh, a very indulgent but huge capstone on this moment. So you can have those moments where you bring like, I want you guys to just hear this music or watch this thing and know that this exactly is happening in this moment, um, uh, which was very, very fun and rewarding. Um, but to that point, whether you're doing specific musical stings, whether you're doing scoring, like just sort of tension building music underneath, or whether you are, um, uh, doing like ambient noise, like uh, forest at night, so, you know, like bird song, mm -hmm. wind howling, uh, all that's available on YouTube. And uh, you can like mess around and experiment with that. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, two things I want to say really quickly. One, it just made me happy. You talked about the personification, personification of destiny, the personification of luck. When I was Tumblr role playing, I actually played the personification of coincidence. Ooh! And they were in a, like, not a rivalry, but in a, somewhat of uh, a rivalry with the personification of fate. Because they're like, you have to do this. No, nah, I'm just going to happen when it's supposed to happen. Like, it's fine. <laughs> just going to chill. Like, it just happened. Like, no, you had nothing. It just happened. Tr chill. But like, so it's funny you said that. I was like, ooh, that just took me back. Uh, anywho, uh, but also, uh, it's also important to denote, um, because um, truthfully, it are you trying to stream this game or are you just trying to play at home or with friends? If it's on stream, be careful. You're not doing anything that will get you copyright strike struck because you will uh, real quick. Um, however, though, if you're just playing with friends at home, legit, video game scores are your best friend. <laughs> Skyrim has some of the best ambient music out there. It is just gorgeous. It's there. I use it a lot. That, Halo, all these other games that you just don't realize have some really good music in the background, just look at it. I guarantee you, there are playlists on YouTube. I personally use Spotify, because I love Spotify. Um, you can look, and honestly, you can look up on D, on, on YouTube, D&D &D Tavern Playlist. I guarantee you, you will find something that someone's made for the exact thing that you need. So look it up. He's right. YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, whatever. They have the things for you. It's there. Have fun. Hell yes. The, uh, uh, <laughs> the incredible resources await. Um, this next one comes to us from JK. Thanks, JK. JK. Uh, JK. How, <laughs> how do you balance slash effectively collaborate with your players on world building as a DM? Great question. Thanks, JK. Um, uh, how do you effectively collaborate on world building with your uh, with your game master, your storyteller, your dungeon master, whomever? This is a question that a lot of PCs have, and it's a very funny thing because I, I I've been thinking about this a lot recently in terms of there's this kind of static idea in in D and D and in a lot of other tabletops that have a GM of like 
I am responsible for my PC. Mm-hmm. The other PCs are, or the other players are responsible for their PCs. And then the dungeon master is responsible for the world, the NPCs, ex- external phenomena, right? Mm-hmm. But we all know that, that that line gets blurry and in a lot of places can and should um, be, be fudged. Be, it should be, yeah. it should, that barrier should be broken down, right? Because first of all, a lot of players uh, will end up creating NPCs by creating their family, and right? Yeah, exactly. Right? So those are going to be NPCs. Um, uh, and one thing, actually, that I remember talking uh, about with a PC a long time ago was, like, a DM should never make a decision for a PC. And it's like, yes, that's absolutely true. However, if you think about it, DMs already do have some authority over the inner lives of PCs when you're narrating a dream. That is very much the mind. Like, like how much control does a DM have over the subconscious mm-hmm. mind of a character? When, uh, when, it, when you are controlling, a, when you're describing a PC's perception or insight role, oftentimes you are in collaboration over what's going on in that mm-hmm. PC's mind, what you notice or don't notice, right? Um, uh, uh, Omega, in your home games and in your streams, like what do you what do you feel like the best like guidelines or rules are for that like that boundary and navigating it of like PCs collaborating in world building? So, firstly, um, you like you said, you already inherently add to the story when you add like PCs to your PC's life. Uh, we add NPCs, sorry, to your PC's life, like family and things of that nature. But I think a good way of going about it as well is you kind of have the ability to influence your home. And, and unless the, the, the campaign itself is about the town that you're in, then your DM might have like specific ideas, but even then you can influence it. Like I'll take creature collectors, for example. I won't give like spoilers really. But it doesn't really matter. This might air way after. Um, we were asked specifically what our PC is, obviously. What happens around our PC? Who's close to our PC? Things of that nature. You have the ability to shape what goes around, not just with your character, but like the mile bubble or 30-foot bubble around your character. And that is building on the story. Like, for instance, my character, Agrios, and Creature Collector, he is a wild soul barbarian Leonin. He's a lion with a rainbow mane. (gasps) That is so cool. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the big thing, the big big plot uh, line, which I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil, but the thing is he was left at the doorstep of a a half-elf family wrapped in this just beautiful cloth and a stick that was next to him. And that stick is now the, the 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 part that's attached to the axe that he uses now. The cloth is like his loincloth, and he has naturally rainbow like ness in his hair. And whenever he rages, it moves, it shifts. It's it's we don't he doesn't know what it is. But with all that being said, he I I designed his his trainer who taught him how to cut wood and other things. I designed the town around him and what, what he'd normally go through, what he'd do throughout his normal day. And the DM takes that and then builds the story from that as well. You don't have to always put it all on the DM. You have the ability to influence what you want and what you believe happened around your character. And then they they will then take that and collaborate and make something really pretty about it, pretty pretty from it. Those are always, to me, my favorite things to do are to, like, world build off of something that was itself a gift. Like, Mm -hmm. a player created something, gave it to the story, and then you move from that. Back in my days when I was uh, an improv coach and teacher, I used to say all the time, uh, uh, yes, I I did improv uh, at UCB and performed in New York for many years. Nice! (laughs) So, there you go. Um, But uh, we... One of the things I always said is like the the improv is not about making stuff up fast. Mm-hmm. You know, making stuff up is something that is a skill you learn really early on. Like being being creative is one thing. The magic of improv doesn't live in the moment where a sober adult on a stage, you know, that that pays taxes and is responsible goes, 
like, oh my God, like, green aliens are descending on us. The magic improv is in someone saying that and the second responsible adult going, my God, you're right. That's, yeah. that, that, that yes and, yeah. The affirmation of that thing. So the best part for me is like, someone sends me a little bit of backstory. They say, here's my trainer, here's other person. And you take that and five sessions in, 10 sessions in, suddenly whoom, that comes to life in front of the person. Mm -hmm. And you're like, see, like, look, I like that thing that you made came to life. That's like the best feeling in the world um, uh, to take as a DM. So I think exactly like you're saying, I love PCs having authority to engage in that world building and create that background. Mm -hmm. um, I think like the the only time that ever gets problematic or troublesome is if people are doing stuff that like is going to intersect with some element of your plot in a weird way. But I mm -hmm. think the, the easy way around that is to just create these domains where it's like, hey, your character, like like you as the player, feel free to improvise like, you, you know, cool, you're this like, you're this Pokemon collector. If you know, like, feel free to improvise anything about the knowledge of that craft and that will become true, right? Like mm -hmm. you kind of make these domain specific things uh, uh, that for the most part work out, I think really, really well. And again, it's super gratifying to be able to yes and those as the GM position when those mm -hmm. come to life in the world. For sure. Um, I, I love that. Um, we got some more, uh, questions here. Um, uh, I like questions. I like questions too. I want to make a question bar now. Whenever they <laughs> talk, whenever they do something, it's like, why? Oh, that'd be interesting. Flavoring all their spells in the form of a question. I Almost like Jeopardy. Yeah. Riddle me this, Batman. Um, oh. uh, <laughs> Yes. The Riddler as a bard is very cool. Doing a high fantasy Batman with all, statting out all the all the different. So fun fact, I'm actually, so we've been playing, a couple of us have been playing an Avengers inspired campaign. <gasps> and we're starting a Gotham inspired, like two shot coming Ooh. up in a couple of weeks. And I'm actually playing Zatanna. Oh, God, Zatanna is one of my favorite characters of all time. I an illusionist it. wizard. And I literally changed all of my spells and turned them backwards. I am not ready. I am not ready at all. Oh, oh my God! Uh, I, I do know. I do know. Roger Migami is major image. I know that. <laughs> I have that one ready. I don't, have, I don't have comprehend languages ready though. <laughs> that's gonna be a hard. That's a lot of consonants in that one. There's a, yeah. That's gonna be a hard one to to get through. Um. Oh my God. Uh. That's so cool. Um. Uh. This next one comes to us from Harrison. Thanks, Harrison. Um, uh, uh, hey, Brennan. Um, one of my least favorite aspects of DMing is running shopping segments, as it's a hassle to come up with a handful of shopkeeper NPCs and their wares on the fly, and it always grinds the pace of the adventure to a halt. However, I know it's an important way to reward players and let them spend all the gold they've earned. Mm -hmm. Do you have any alternatives to the standard shopping experience that would satisfy both me and my players. Thanks for the question, Harrison. Um, this is an interesting one because I feel like not every campaign dives into, necessarily has an economy like this. Yeah. Like, like how, like, would you say like the majority of the games you play in have that kind of really statted out like number economy to them? Mine don't for the most part. It's like, hey, you got 400 gold. Am I ever going to use it? I don't know, <laughs> but I have it. Thanks. But no, it, it really doesn't get, I mean, my home campaign, he's done something really cool just because we're based in the actual sea in this place called the planar sphere um, that he's kind of made his own. So we have ways to spend money and I get things, but like past that in other games, not really. It doesn't really come up. And I wish it did actually because it's there. Right, exactly. Well, it's interesting in 5e because they in in 3.5 D&D magic items had costs. So the part of the reason you were getting these goofy piles of gold that if you really start to think about like if you kill a dragon and get its golden hoard, you have just like yes, you're rich, but you've also inherited the biggest project in the world now of mm -hmm. like how do we move all this? Go like you can't just go to the local town and be like, hey, um, I got this money I need to put in. It's like, does this world have banking? Where do we put mm -hmm. this? Now? 
Like, yeah. you know, there's some some magistrate from the king is going to be like, you're going to destroy our economy. You know, like, <laughs> inflation. Um, but I think that one of the... I'll listen. Like I, I have a, a bell that I keep ringing all the time, which is that the key to world building isn't logistics; it's tone, right? Yeah. It's tone, it's genre, it's mood. And I think if you are playing a game that really feels like a fairy tale, it's gonna be a weird vibe when you go try to buy a magic sword. Like, you know, like no, like what? In, in like look for like any culture in the world that has mythic heroes and have it be like where did you get the sword of the king and it's like i bought it in town <laughs> like, <laughs> like, nope that's not how the fairy tale goes no nope, like no matter what storytelling culture it comes from it's sort of like if you're in that mythic space economy is not like commerce is not going to feel like the right vibe yeah, so so I think that you need to go to a couple places. Like one of the weird things is that D and D is an old enough game that it kind of has its own mythos around it. Uh -huh. So, so like going and buying potions that cost a certain amount of money, and like before the adventure, we go and buy potions. That is a vibe that does, even though it's not mythological. It's established through D and D. It's established through Final Fantasy. You go yeah. get your, you know, like you go get your Phoenix down. You go get mm -hmm. your. Um, so I would say to you, if you want to run fun shopping encounters in your thing, make sure that you're in a world that feels like Final Fantasy, or it's not gonna vibe, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, and for me, I tend to, like, or it make it that comedic, like, yeah, like. Either make it make it that you're in Final Fantasy world and you have this intense economy. Mm -hmm. Make it a world that's really low magic, that's all about survival. And so, like, if you have pirates, if you want to do like a gritty pirate campaign, make survival hard. Make it like every day have people mark off the money it takes to feed themselves. Yeah. So that you're so that you're playing in that gritty world. Um, but also, I think one of the things that that I still do to this day is because I don't w like um, don't want the feeling of like like where did you get Excalibur? Ah, I bought it. I bought it at the sword store. Like yeah. um, you can track how much treasure people should be getting and convert that into magic items and stuff like mm -hmm. rather than being like hey you have x amount of silver pieces and it's y amount of gem based art objects rolled on table 35c Period. just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like why why do you have an art piece of mona lisa and Faerun? why do you have it i don't understand <laughs> i don't now if it was like beholder lisa i'll get it but still like... <laughs> the beholder lisa but that's my thing is beholder lisa is rad that should be something we know is going to be in this. I would rather, if we're going to have Beholder Lisa, let's have a heist around it. Like, yes, it is, yes. Beholder head, beautiful gown, hair coming through the eye stalks, <laughs> smile, and it's like, you have the no smile, idea. Knowing she's about the disintegration of you. <laughs> like, run that heist. That's cool as hell. And then there's a story behind it. Yeah. Again, it's like it's it's kind of funny because like I feel like I I don't I don't want to answer the question by invalidating the question. Like there are ways to do shopping that are fun and cool. However, my go-to is usually like if you want to hit this mythological fantasy tone that feels like mythology, feels like storytelling, um, you know, objects of legend should be acquired in legendary fashion. Agreed. You should be Fully. But I, I also want to say, though, that you are the GM. DM, whichever title you choose to use, it's your life, live it. Um, you do have the ability to be like, okay, you want this push of healing? Well, guess what? It's not here. Uh, you have the ability wherever you're at, whether you're at a big major town or you just happen to stop through this area that has like a merchant just selling things off to the side, you have the ability, one, to set the tone of that shopping um, scene or whoever's selling the things to you. Again, if you're in a major city, yeah, they might have some extra things, but 
keep in mind that that won't be the case everywhere. And even with that being said, you can say in your mind, like knowing going into this game, going to the session, knowing that they're probably potentially going to go to a shopping person, you can say, yeah, they probably have one potion. They have this one thing. They have this one thing because they might have acquired that. And if you want to bring magic items into it, something I like to do personally when I have DM or I've played in games is have a magic item that isn't necessarily catered to anyone in the group yet. Mm. Have it be something they want to learn about. Be like, they have this thing because you don't want to just have a random magic gray axe for the barbarian there. That's not fun. However, having a random wand that does something that the barbarian is interested in for some reason, I don't know why the barbarian would be, but having, or, or like a pebble that's actually a an opal that is inserted into a hilt of a blade that they have to find, like that is more story driving, story driven, and that's going to add more for the characters in the long run. Don't cater to the characters just because they want to shop. Guess what? You shouldn't have got hit by the fireball. <laughs> Dodge next time. Like, I mean, that's being extra, but that's just the truth. Not every shop is going to cater to the characters, and you have the ability to say that. You have the ability to say, they don't have everything that you want. How are you going to figure it out? Because that's what D&D is, it's figuring things out. Yes, it's problem solving. It, yes. it's, it's collaboration. There's so many things I want to respond to in what you just said. I love that. Number one, I think that's such great advice to give people cool magic stuff, but give it to them in a way that's going to create dynamic, interesting stories. Like. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the best magic items I ever got, Molly Ostertag gave a character of mine. I was a uh, a multi-class monk cleric. And <gasps> this is monk cleric too. Sorry. Oh, it's great. It's so it's good. Um, and you know, what were what would be the things that would make that character that if I if if like Brennan, the like crunchy math player, was sitting down to be like, how do I optimize? How do I, you know, something that increases my damage output, something that allows me to, you know, doubles my movement, yada yada, something that makes me more mobile because I'm already focusing on that. I got a ring of water breathing. It was the coolest thing in the world because it, it, it didn't optimize my character at all. It gave him a power that he was he was a tempest cleric from an mm. island tempest cleric from an island setting that specifically like had a connection to the ocean and when he got the ring of water breathing every scene where I could just swim down into the water and be down there interacting with the sea life it like brought that character to life so I think your characters will look the urge to keep your PC alive is real. I'm not gonna fault anyone for wanting to crunch numbers to make their character optimized because who wants to lose their PC when you could have gotten two more hit points from that right feat you could have chosen, right? Yeah. But as a DM, you can give people that pebble, that wand, that thing that is going to unlock another side and another story from their character. And I guarantee it'll be better than giving them that sword that exactly optimizes the ability that the character already has totally focused themselves on. Um, the other thing I wanted to say too, to what you said was um, you were talking about like uh, not having it be specifically catered to them. Like this store is doing what it's doing. And I think this is like a golden rule for DMing in general, which is to a certain degree, Figure out what it is your this scene or this story beat is trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Like, what is the role of this? I might, in your circumstance, for, for Harrison who's asking the question, clock my players and go, okay, these, these guys have all expressed an interest in shopping. They want to go get materials. Clock the vibe. Again, it's all communication with the people, the real human beings that are at the table with you. Mm-hmm. Are they excited to have their characters go and shop? Or is this your players trying to take necessary precautions uh -huh. for the next dungeon? Because if you're clocking them and it, it seems like the vibe is this hyper practical, no one's using their character voice. No one's going like, let's see what the shopping district in town is like. They're like, we need to get supplies for the dungeon. In that case, Listen, if I'm if it's a certain time of night and I'm tired, I might be like, look, I'm gonna go make coffee, open the player's handbook, that's how much stuff costs. I'll be back in 10 minutes. And be like, because if they don't want to run a scene, you forcing them to do that is not necessarily gonna be the right vibe. Yeah. I you know, 
I, I think sometimes too that like, especially if you also, if you're a DM that has harsh consequences where like the last dungeon they were in, you were like, oh, you guys don't have a 10 foot pole. All these traps go off. Don't be surprised when they want a shopping trip yep. at the next because you've trained them to yeah 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 you you trained them to expect something right. so like yeah but you're you're one hundred percent correct is it more character driven or is it player driven and neither one is better than the other and one isn't more important or or just it's okay both are okay but understand what angle they're they're wanting to shop for and base it off that my dm does it a lot um he knows that we like to stock up at times because like specifically like in my home game we don't necessarily go into like the world we go into these instances instances and they're like memories and we have to figure something out about that memory but he specifically said this last time when you go in we're going to be in there for a while so get everything you need before you leave because guess what's not happening in game? Shopping, unless it's like in that memory and it makes sense. So like, yeah, that moment where it's like, yeah, we need to make sure we have this, we have that, and we're prepared. So like, no, are they doing it because they just want to be prepared as players because they might be too reckless and they always rush into battle and they need healing? Or is the character actually interested in finding something? And if it's character-based, those are the perfect moments to be like, yeah, you have a potion but there's also this box. Do you want to open it? Like you have those moments. You can, it, it drives the story. So yeah, it all depends on what they're looking for. Honestly. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, uh, love that question. Um, speaking of instances, that sounds so cool, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and are those run sort of like flashbacks or are they like how... So the story is, oh, the story is so good. But basically we're at the, so we're in the act three of the campaign. This is the last part of this campaign. And we we were led by this leader type mm -hmm. person. So like the planisphere is basically this place where they track like wild magic instances and all these things just trying to make sure that everything is as it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, and it hasn't been that way. Um, long story short, that leader person got killed in the act two finale and he was hiding something. He was doing some some stuff that basically helped him become this god type being who's like past the gods and all this stuff is trying to rewrite the world and rewrite the story and it's just a lot. We're going into his memory, this specific memory. We're gonna find out why he was doing a lot of stuff that he did. So yeah, these instances are this these little pocket bubbles that we get sent into. It's like blue skin do blue blue skin do so can you you know jump into. <laughs> Uh, but just like it's it's been interesting to play it like that because we have done times where like we went to like Cholt or we went to like Faye and all these things. But like we've had a lot of these moments where like, no, we're literally going into the memory and we're becoming that person in the memory. Uh, so, yeah, wow. it's, it's interesting. It's been a lot of fun. This has been stressful, but it's been a lot of fun. Oh, I <laughs> love that. Sounds so cool. I love that kind of trippy like. Ooh, especially because D and D is such an interesting storytelling medium because uh -huh. it could like the the because it's structured like the players are living their day to day real life and there can be that interesting balance between verisimilitude and realism and being like hey we're just like we're going shopping we're making pragmatic decisions we're tr we're being people in a dangerous situation making the choice we really really make and then on the other hand being like but we want arcs, we want narrative, we want story. Mm -hmm. And so hearing uh, like uh, a campaign has something so geared up to be like, yes, this is tangible and real and in game. And also it's providing this catharsis and insight and storytelling. Ooh, mm -hmm. it, it's nice. It is very nice. Um, hell yeah. Um, so here's a fun, this actually, uh, this question brings us right to this next one uh, from James. Uh, thanks, James. Hey, uh, James, got a peach? Ooh. <laughs> Woo! I just watched that movie recently. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that movie is so crazy. The ants drive on the bottom of the ocean from England to New York, and that's normal. And the bugs, or any case, I'll get into <laughs> it. I'll get into another time. Watch that movie. It's there's some weird stuff going on. Um, James asks. Uh, James asks, what's the best way of putting flashbacks into sessions for the PCs, and how do you prep for them? Um, great that's, question. Oh, that's good. Oh, we got warned in the campaign that I'm starting that we're going to have flashbacks. So they're just, it's on my mind right now. Um, honestly, so a big, again, 
goes back to something we already said. Know your character's backstory. Know your player's character's backstory. And if you don't know it, talk to them and understand it. Because you can take those moments, those specific moments that you know are blips in their history that made them who they are. You can take those and hone in for a second. And you can do it through dreams. You can do it through, honestly, one of the best parts, one of the best ways someone's ever done a flashback for me was that we knew that we were going into a really big battle. And we were doing all this stuff beforehand, and you know, we're getting prepped and whatever. And we got to the door that led to where this big bad was. As the door opened, flash of white. We went into a flashback. We went into what what happened, how we prepped for this moment, each of us. It was like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> it was like, it, but it's those moments that that add to the overall drama and excitement and just that 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 drive and that power within the moment of going into that door, everything that happened before that, we got to just have that moment. And it was just like, oh, and as the last person finished their flashback, it flashed back to the door opening. And he was like, we'll finish off next week. How dare you? <laughs> like, like, but like, we got to, like, those moments, you can take a flashback and make it, powerful by inserting it in the most random moment that you wouldn't expect a flashback to be. Like, you wake up in the morning and you're all in a tavern or whatever and you go down to eat some cereal or you go down to eat some some bread or whatever. And as your character looks open or looks over at like someone across from them, a flashback can happen then like being with your family and having a good time because right now it sucks, but back then it was okay. Like you can insert those flashbacks in the best spots, and the best spots are the spots that they don't expect it. It's not a dream, or you're stuck in a spell. It's just out of the blue. It, mm -hmm. it feels right. It feels like it feels they're not expecting it, so that makes it even more like exciting for them. In my personal opinion, I don't know. Like, how, how do you feel? Because I think I think it's 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 nice when it's like it's off guard. It's like oh oh. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like my my response is like any way you can get them. I never met a flashback I didn't like. I well, here, here's the thing. I think you're a hundred percent right that like they are. Oh, there's so much to say. That's such a good question. Um, what I'll say is this. I think using flashbacks is an incredible tool. I've used it in I think every single season of Dimension Twenty, as certainly every home game I've ever mm -hmm. done, and they all have a different purpose, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a character who's a dream sorcerer in the Unsleeping City. He's got a ton of weird dream trippy imagery that, you know, is, is very classically mythological mm -hmm. in terms of like finding visions and dreams, but is also, I think, a very helpful tool for a dungeon master. Because look, I'll be honest, you're limited as a dungeon master in terms of your adventures and plot hooks because you know, I am responsible for this universe and all of it having causality, dominoes hitting each other. Mm -hmm. But like, I'm just some guy. I don't know, like, I, I'm not always the best predictor of what people are gonna notice or what people are gonna catch. So a lot of times you'll use dreams and flashbacks and those metaphors to highlight moments of focus of like, I'm yes. gonna, just like in fairy tales, a dream is gonna give you a moment of clarity about mm -hmm. what you should focus your attention on, right? Yes. Um, I think flashback, and I think also we look at flashbacks as what does a flashback accomplish? And I think the the issue for that is very quickly, like TRPGs accumulate the present. You start in the tavern, you start as the adventure begins and we have this present moment, but we don't have the past. And what we yes. know intimately and deeply about the real world is that the past is present with us all the time. It is around us everywhere. Everything around us is explained through our history and through our past. And it can be really challenging to get into character, to understand the stakes of an adventure, to feel the weight of a given moment mm -hmm. with, without feeling the lived reality of the character's past. So I think flashbacks are vital and necessary to take the character that isn't humanized yet and fully humanize them by seeing where they come from and what their story is. To see a moment where 
uh, uh, we see how a villain became the way they are through a looking glass, a crystal ball, some scrying thing, a pool mm-hmm. of water. Um, because again, uh, you know, limited perspective is part of the reality of everyone in our real world. Yep. But when we're trying to tell a story at the table, it can be so gratifying to be like, here's this new perspective. Um, I love flashbacks when they, you know, we, we've we had flashbacks in A Crown of Candy, the season we just did, where mm. um, the characters watched one of their it was the first PC permadeath um, in the campaign, and the PCs were all fleeing from the, their vastly more powerful enemies. And as they were covered in blood and breathing heavily and knew they were in danger, we just flash back to these little moments, as you were saying, when Oof. things were better, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, of better days. And that is so uh, good. It was like, it's, it, it's so important. You see, and we can feel the characters round out and yes. the detail increases and you see these moments because like one little moment can give you this other source of light and mm-hmm. add an entire new dimension to a character and make it so much more playable and fun for that PC. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the way you prep for them too is um, know what it is you're trying to say. It's okay yeah. to be to be like, we are gonna see a moment of heartbreak that is going to illuminate this present moment where we see why this character is so guarded. Yeah. We are going, you know, like, there, there are no that it's just not to not to bring it to singing, but it's those mm-hmm. you certain notes that you play will harmonize and they will yes. bring that they will bring something that is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, it's oh my god, oh my god, them running away and just having flash. Oh, that's that's sad. <laughs> that's sad. I, I will be honest. I mean, like, like we're all human. I have not been able to watch all of you know uh, Crown of Candy yet, but like I've been wanting to just go back and just like, okay, I love this group. I want to learn more. Candy. <laughs> so like I've been like, yes, yes, I need this. I need this a lot. Uh, um, well, listen, we, I, I feel like we have to play at some point now so that we, mm-hmm. I can, I can get, give you the full uh, uh, flashback treatment. Because <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I, I love that we're both so into this. Um, and I think it's great too. What I love about the instances from, from the campaign you were describing is I think flashbacks can be totally great whether they're diegetic or not. Like in in that case with the running, the flashback was like a total like TV or movie flashback where the characters, it was like we were we were changing where the camera was. The audience was seeing a flashback, but the characters weren't necessarily seeing that flashback. Yeah. Um uh it was f- for for narrative purposes. But I think it's awesome to also, like you're saying, the moment at the bar, the person flashes back, they are lost in their memories for a moment. I will say, be aware if you create flashbacks that are really diegetic and they're like tangible in the world, like in this case, it's like a floating bubble. It's a living memory. You can jump into it. Mm -hmm. I did a flashback one time that was in the, it was in the halls of legend and these characters could go and see their friends. And it actually ended up being one of the coolest moments. This same luck, luck and destiny sorcerer I was talking about went into the party's wizard's memories, but it was sort of like, it was more than memory. It was legend itself. It was like the past. And the party wizard was this intense, dour, older guy, um, had watched his father be killed on the deck of an airship. And his father's like arch rival threw this kid over the banister of the airship and the kid hit the ground and survived. And the wizard had taken like toughness feats and all these things like that, but it still was like, man, how did your character survive? It was just part of his backstory that we never sort of addressed. It was like, that's intense. And but realistically, that's pretty wild that he would survive. In any case, no one knew that part of the wizard's backstory. The luck child sorcerer character went into the, the legend of this moment saw it saw the the young you know 12 year old boy that would become the wizard thrown over the edge and as the sorcerer was a guest in this memory Mm -hmm. he threw a luck spell of protection out and hit it retroactively justifying how that had happened back in the moment it was one of oh that's so good though (laughs) That's so good, but like time is intangible, anything like that, you don't know what's influencing it. And just the fact that he jumped in and actually was basically the reason he survived. Right, That's yeah. so good. Oh, oh, oh. that's uh, awesome. That yeah, gave me feelings. 
Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, that was one of my favorite. So yes, th that's the kind of thing, I think, whether the flashbacks are tangible, magical elements of the world, or you're just using them like how a TV or a movie would have used them, where they're a narrative tool, it's all groovy. Agreed. Uh, um, uh, this is so fun. Uh, I think we have time for probably one more question here. One more question. <laughs> this one's I was trying to say question and that, that didn't come out. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> anywho. <laughs> the feeling was there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Uh, this one comes to us from Julie B. Thanks, Julie, Julie B. Julie B. Um, my party has a fair split of shy and outgoing players. How can I, as a player, encourage shyer party members to jump in more often, or should I respect that they don't want to or aren't comfortable speaking up as much? Thanks, Julie B. Um, yeah. Mean, yeah, I mean, we kind of touched at this already. It's the fact that, two things, again, it's not just about the DM, U.S. players can also facilitate this idea of bringing people in. Um, but before I get into that part, again, that's session zero. Establish what people are comfortable with. Uh, and I know this is already happening, so like this is a little different, but like for anyone who is starting, you know that you're going to be playing with some folks who are a little more shy, and then you're playing with the prima donna, um, which isn't a bad thing. It's like understand comfort, comfort, comfort levels of every player even as a player, and then you know how to navigate the game once it happens. But for you, already being here, one, you can talk to them out of character and be like, hey, I noticed that you're, you know, a little uh, taken aback or these things, you kind of are a little more quiet. Would you be okay if I brought you into the story more, blah, blah, blah? Do you want to talk about potential stuff with our characters? So even being shy, your character who might not be shy has something to lean on, um, which makes it easier for you to get into it. Um, and with that established, you know, yeah, again, take that metaphorical bean bag, and as you're talking, you're talking around a campfire, you say, hey, Jody, how are you? You throw it yeah. to them. It's not about making them have a spotlight, but it's just asking them a question, just subtly bringing them into this fold, so it's not, it's, 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 it's interesting how it happens. You bring them into the fold, and they're helping you with their story, with your story, but slowly but surely, as you talk to, the, talk to them, it's becoming their story with you backing them up, and you're now allowing them to blossom into this game. So yeah, talk to them. Talk to them, talk to them, talk to them. Communication is key. Yes, I think that's totally on the money. And I think that, yeah, as in all things, there's a degree of communication. You're playing with other adults. And I, I also love the, the, the like caveat there of like, I'm a very like extroverted person. I can be like gregarious. Um, and so there's a part of me that when I see someone not doing that, I go, that person's having a bad time. Mm -hmm. you, you don't know that. People have different experiences of things. So I think mm -hmm. it's, it, there's, a, there's a piece of wisdom here of like, don't assume that because someone is not like, uh, uh, is is not talking as much as you think would represent engagement in the game. That might not mean that they're not engaged. They might be really engaged and having a great time. So I think communication is key because you don't want to assume necessarily. And I think that, but that's also a vibe thing. I think if you're good friends with someone, you can tell what you, you can tell from your friend, like, oh, I'm getting a feeling from them that like they're not talking and this is a problem versus mm -hmm. they're not talking uh, and it and it might not or it might be or might not be right. Yeah. Um, so communication, and I think too um, that uh, there's a give and a take here, right? Like everyone has a part to play. If you have really gregarious players at the table, you know, make sure that gently and kindly be like, hey, let's make sure that everyone has an opportunity to interact with NPCs, that people are getting spotlight scenes, right? Yeah. That can be a conversation. You have to make sure that no one's getting steamrolled. Mm -hmm. As a um, and as a DM too, I think you can have that conversation of like, hey, what are you as a player who's maybe not as gregarious or not as extroverted? Like, what are you looking to get from the game? Because you can spotlight that. You can be like, okay, I know that when I throw these characters into a rowdy tavern, player two, three, four are gonna just run off to the wind and have a great time. Player yeah. one is not about that, but they're playing a wizard, so I'm just going to make sure that there's always some little piece of arcana, some new book, a new spell. They said there's always something in a game session for mm -hmm. them to on to. Um, 
Because I think that, that really the, the key to this question is um, shyness is not necessarily like shyness is not in and of itself indicative of a problem. Yeah. If, the, if the person may just be more comfortable um, uh, observing more than verbally contributing. Yeah. Um, um, uh, so I think, you know, figure that out with them. And if you do get a response back, like, yeah, I actually would love to contribute more. Um, one thing that was really fun was I remember there was a, uh, a Shire player I talked to one time who talked about like um, the overemphasis on role playing and and people kind of talking combat down of like that's crunchy that's number stuff we don't care about that and the Shire player was like I really like combat because turns are really helpful for me yeah 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 you know what I mean like taking a turn like I don't know how to interject I don't want to take away from someone else's moment. So how do I, uh, like in a role play scene, I don't intuit the give and take. I, I, I don't have whatever that inner math is of what talking too much or not enough looks like. Um, think about taking turns with role playing. As a DM, you can introduce that. Like you're saying, tossing that bean bag, that's effectively like giving a turn to someone, yeah. right? Um, I think that's a hugely helpful thing um, uh, to help with a Shire player. Um, and I think, too, of like, notice, I think you can also help in character creation if you have a friend that you know is more shy. I think talk with them about that and go, A, do, like, are you into an experience that would be challenging to, like, play the bard? Like, are you looking for that to be like, yeah, I want to play the gregarious character. I'd like in the same way that like people want to play a character unlike them in some ways to like get that experience. Um, or it's also totally valid. Listen, I, I, have again, like, I think in life I'm pretty gregarious. I have played quiet characters and had the time of my life mm -hmm. being in a session where I only said five things. You know what I mean? Like, I remember I played a giant one time who was this like big imposing giant character, and it was really fun to be a uh, you know a man of few words, right? Like that is like a, that can be a fun vibe. That was um, actually Sigma for me. You would think Sigma <laughs> talked a lot. He didn't. He talked when he needed to talk, or he talked when he thought it was the right time to talk, and he acted when he thought it was the right time to act. I'll never forget one of my favorite moments with him. Again, he has an intelligence of seven, <laughs> and they were like. We had to go. We had to protect this little girl. We were in a We had to protect this little girl and get her to this place. And they were like, "We need to make sure that she isn't seen." And one of the paladins, actually, it was Tanya's character, looked at me. Looked at me. He's like, "Do you have anything that you can like make someone invisible?" And he's like, "Oh, you need to be invisible now." And she's like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Oh, okay." And he cast invisibility on the girl, and she was like. I mean, we all need invisibility, though. Can you do that? He goes, oh, you need it as well. Okay. And he ended it on her and put it on the paladin. He's like, we're done. You, do you need anything else? And she's like, I hate you. <laughs> but, like, it was just a small moment. Like, he's not a talker, but he's like, oh, this is when I need it. Okay. This is what I do. <laughs> but, like, totally bad for the moment. But, like, that, those moments that you think someone isn't talking or isn't paying attention or isn't into it, they actually might be. They're just waiting for their turn. They're waiting for the time to do so. So it's okay. But again, yes. it goes back to communication. It's okay for you to say, yes, this is a game. So let me talk to you player to player. Are you actually, are you here? Is there anything I can do? I'm just checking in as a friend. Um, this isn't like an intervention, anything like that. Just, hey, I noticed blank. How are you feeling? And if they're like, I'm good. You're like, oh, okay, great. Um, but it's just about the communication. Yeah, I think that's absolutely 100% on the money. Um, oh, I cannot believe how fast an hour and a half has flown by. Um, oh, my goodness. Um, uh, I just want to say to everyone watching, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Venturing Academy. Uh, I, all of the thanks and gratitude in the world to our amazing guest, Omega Jones. Thank you so much, Omega Jones! Thank you! It's been a lot of fun, and I am really hot, so... <laughs> you can't even see it! You can't even see it! I'm so mad about that. No, no. This is what? That never has an episode concluded in a bigger power Wait, move. I have another one. It's still... <laughs> I quit. 
Un- <laughs> unbelievable. Omega Jones, thank you so much for being here today. <laughs> Absolute joy. Great. Uh, to everyone at home watching, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.